So, um, ladies and gentlemen, we have two speakers tonight. Um, Professor Peter Kavalek is going first. Peter is Professor of Information Systems and Director of the Centre for Information Management at Loughborough University. And he will be talking about the myth of the information processor, which is a session he first gave last month, and we're hoping for an improved version this time, Peter. Uh, and he will be followed uh, a little later on by uh, Dr. Clement Vidal. Uh, Clement is a philosopher with a background in logic and cognitive sciences, and a visiting researcher at SETI at Berkeley. So we're going to be looking at astrobiology in the second half of this session, which um, is certainly going to be a very, very different um, piece of work, I hope, to, to anything we've heard before. Reminder again that we are recording the session, and then, Peter, I'm going to start the clock and hand over to you. You've got about half an hour. There you go. Great. So uh, just to check that you can hear me OK. And um, also to mute themselves, please. Yeah, um, and also to say that astrobiology sounds fascinating, and I hope I'm not just the kind of um, uh, the interrupts be <laughs> beforehand, and um, like the ice cream person overstaying his or her welcome in the theatre. The um, uh, purpose of today, I'll just uh, take. Um, 25 minutes or 30 minutes or so to talk through but this literature in a way or this idea set of concepts called the attention economy which have been around for a while they're never quite coming into the mainstream um, never quite fully building but um, nonetheless saying something very interesting and I think um, uh, s still with time ahead this idea of the attention economy or the the um, a kind of wrong way of looking at us as people, which is to see us as information processors. Some implications for cybernetics as we go through. And, and the basic argument is just simply to say that based on this kind of nascent literature, I will kind of argue that a kind of crisis of attention has developed and uh, uh, there might be solutions that will follow from a kind of cybernetics of attention from uh, literally uh, designing attention. So just to begin, uh, let's explore the virtue, the tremendous virtue and privilege of being cut off from information. So it is uh, said that uh, Ernest Hemingway, before writing, would sharpen six pencils and uh, would stand then at a small desk in the corner of a room writing into his notebooks. Um, many of you will, will know the legend of Jack Kerouac, um, who was uh, said to have locked himself into a cupboard and typed onto a long roll of architectural paper so as to avoid the mental interruption of inserting new pieces of, let's say, A4 paper into his typewriter. Uh, George Orwell, um, again, quite famously wrote 1984, situating his desk against a blank wall in a small cottage in Scotland, I believe, but the, the wall in front of him was white. Uh, just his mind, the paper, the desk, the pencil or the pen. Um, somewhat differently, Virginia Woolf was known as one of, um, was known for kind of walking and thinking her ideas into existence. Uh, she famously claimed to, a writer needs a, a room of her own, and then kind of frequent, um, walked around um, the, the, the park and I think Coram Fields, isn't it, in, in Bloomsbury. Um, uh, Th Theroux was also famously argued about the power of walking ideas into existence, formulating his ideas and words before returning to his cabin to, to write. And, and Einstein, of course, is famous for strolling the Princeton campus. You know, he was seen maybe by um, you know, star, starstruck young undergraduates as, as he would stroll the campus in Princeton, as again, he he built a kind of system of thinking, system of, of being dependent on some time uh, away from uh, other stimuli, some time away from, from words to just go and walk the, the campus and to think himself in, into the right place. So in praise of these walkers and these hiders, um, I think a kind of anthropology of the campus, sometimes called a kind of a, um, an architecture of attention, 
that's um uh, uh, i'll just have to think uh, uh, to attribute that quote but and um, the university as was represented a kind of architecture of attention this is the uh, quad at new college in oxford a space for walking for being for hiding away and nurturing one's own ideas in, in, into life, literally built into the kind of 16th century uh, fabric of the, of the building, a space to cultivate the mind into attention. This is the library at Trinity College, Dublin. Similarly, you know, the kind of dark space, the isolation, uh, ways of bringing oneself into a relation with the books here, the information types here, but away from distraction. Um, uh, you know, a kind of a, a deep space for deep thinking. And it's, it was at Trinity that I first began to get interested in these, this topic because I was external examined there for four years. And uh, on one of the occasions, uh, they took me as a guest around the old buildings. Um, they were 17th, 18th century, um, 18th century buildings at the front of Trinity there, you'll, you'll know the kind of the old quad, uh, etc. And they took me on the interior tour and I was struck by the fact that they were taking me from, for example, a reading room uh, to another reading room, to maybe a smoking room, to uh, a reading room, to a library, to a common room, to a reading room, to a library. And again, I began to think of this Alan de Botton's phrase of the architecture of attention. And this idea that this was a kind of this university, this physical structure of the university was a kind of machine for nurturing attention into a kind of productive life. So a kind of a machine for nurturing a productive attention into, into life. And that's what it was uh, designed to do. Now, if I switch then to the 21st century, and I kind of take a slight segue for a moment into the world of David, David Graeber. And uh, I think most of us at least enjoy the title of his book, Bullshit Jobs. And um, some of us <laughs> uh, very much enjoy the content too. But in his uh, book, Bullshit Jobs, in which he's basically um, the late David Graeber, so they sadly died about two years ago, wasn't it? But he basically throwing down rain upon um, uh, you know it, what what we consider a kind of productive life in the in the modern economy, and uh, taking apart the idea that so many jobs, whether they be in different office environments, in in some of the ubiquitous call centres and the bureaucratic roles, and so on and so forth, that whether these roles are actually worthy of anyone, and he's just kind of saying that they are they are kind of a, a bullshit, as he doesn't um, uh, hold back in his phraseology. So. Graeber had this idea, but one of the kind of key and most interesting points that he makes is that he considers this idea of um, a kind of increasing bureaucratization as actually native to capitalism. The normal story that we tell is that capitalism uh, it encourages things to be increasingly lean, that in a competitive environment, firms become, uh, and other units become increasingly lean and um, and pared down as they seek efficiency, productivity mainly. But Graeber's making a kind of opposite argument saying, that doesn't seem to be the case because we seem to wander around with lots and lots of people checking other people's other checkings and checkers of the checkers and people sending messages about the form to other people um, processing messages about the other form. And what is all this kind of bullshit, he says, and doesn't this seem to be naturally um, happening uh, uh, you know, a, a kind of natural consequence of the state of the modern firm. So if I just persist with this segue for, for a moment, uh, David Graeber is kind of asking if, if capitalism, contrary to its reputation, might intrinsically, at least these days, intrinsically generate low value administration, checking, double checking, inefficiency, and ultimately meaninglessness. And this is kind of, uh, in our terms of cybernetics, a kind of patho pathological autopoiesis of risk management uh, among insecure employees. I think we can basically theorize it that way, that where we put management and management hierarchies in some state of insecurity, and people have to, um, in a sense, justify their existence, 
uh, uh, and that might be on a kind of contract to contract basis or just simply a kind of day to day basis, justify their worth in these uh, management structures. One of, one of the ways of which you cope is basically by offsetting the risks um, through contracts that you set with, with um, other employees. And um, Graeber, for example, cites the case of an, of an IT um, uh, employee who, who would drive out to check whether computers have been correctly installed in different buildings. It was, uh, some, uh, it was a private contractor to, to the MOD. Uh, knowing very well that when he got there, everything would be perfectly well. But, but the contract between the installer and the client had no validity unless he checked. And these contracts seem to, uh, within the modern workplace, seem to generate this kind of meaninglessness, uh, double checking inefficiency, et cetera, that Graeber complained about. And I would argue that actually the, one of the reasons why we have this phenomenon today is because of email. Email is a kind of soft contracting mechanism. It's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a movement of the, um, uh, what might have been the kind of verbal and, and the, um, uh, you know, hidden into, into a scene and a contractive kind of environment. To, to, make a, to send an email to somebody is in a way a soft contract that you are writing with that person and potentially within some sort of insecure management structure an offsetting of your risk against some other individual. So it tends to um, move into a kind of state of profusion. We, we um, uh, put a little bit of nervous anxiety in as a little special droplet into the um, environment and boof, we are off and people are generating emails and sending them to each other uh, at an ever increasing rate. And we've seen this happen over the course of our careers and so on. Um, uh, we, we all all have fond memories of our first email and um, a, a deepened uh, resentment of our 57,000th, uh, which we uh, all passed very, very long time ago. And so in my kind of segue here, as I kind of move to the side of the main message around attention, I'm sort of saying that our computer systems seem to be part of a kind of a destruction of the old... Um, and nurturing of attention into productive life. If we once saw attention as something so precious, something uh, so important on which the fate of um, a university, a department, or maybe a society around it might hang, then, then, then what are we doing with it today? And I would say that the computer environment that we have has become a kind of disaster. Uh, again, not mentioning my, my uh, word, but words, but I recall um, when I was first in a kind of computing department, there was HCI. Uh, do you remember human computer interaction? And there were kind of a disciplinarity around defining um, how uh, computer interfaces would integrate with uh, individuals from their cognitive processes through to their greater work environment, a kind of recursive structure of understanding that interface to the personal environment. It seems that with email and other tools, that's been completely lost. We've actually lost. We've actually now got a very different kind of environment that's, that's uh, crept in and is now, uh, um, in a sense, colonizing us rather than uh, 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 we using it as a tool. So today and every day, if I just extend my point now about email, today and every day, um, if you sit down at, uh, at your computer with the intention of completing some simple task, writing a chapter of On the Road, writing uh, a Hemingway short story, or whatever it is you do, you know, writing that paper, writing that report, whatever matters to you, once you sit down, actually the first thing you've got to do is secure your own mind uh, against all of the content of the, of the web, Twitter, the latest news, the football, the inquest into the hungry 4 nil, this kind of thing. What you've got to do is, is, first of all, secure your cognitive space against all of the temptation of the uh, internet and the web um, and all that it is saying to you. Once you're into that kind of work process, you will be find yourself different to Hemingway working with his stubby pencil against a piece of paper or George Orwell 
in front of his blank wall, you will find yourself tripping over features and functions in your ever so helpful stroke unhelpful computer environment. You know, control Z becomes the kind of the key to productive life because if you're anything like me, you are typing away and you just, your little finger just is a millimeter out of position and suddenly you've clicked some sort of shortcut that some uh, designer has put into your system and, and you, fi you find, oh, uh, you know, I've set off my news feed. Oh, I've, um, I've just replaced some of the text. I've got a control Z, get back, start again. Uh, you, you know, Jack Kerouac uh, put himself in the cupboard with a long roll of architectural paper, would not have been able to stand windows. Um, along the way, personalized advertising um, will be trying to grab you, trying to find you at every juncture it, it can. And it will come at you very well, um, enabled by machine learning, by all that clever programming, all of that history that you have, it will come at you well. It will come at you with some skill and some audacity, not with irrelevant advertising, but with something close to the to the bone, something close to the to the nerve. Perhaps after this talk, it will be advertising to me books about old quad architecture in old universities, for example. And uh, into this world, we submit ourselves as scholars, as thinkers, as productive workers to be overwhelmed by a kind of um, set of stimuli which we cannot control. And as uh, Shosanna Zuboff puts it, uh, through this, we are kind of losing the right to the future tense. That's quite a big message. But what she's saying is that that will to will, she's citing Sartre when she says that, but that will to will, when you sit down at your, at your device, seeking to write that report, that chapter, that novel, that's yours. That's you. That's yours. And your manifestation of that should be facilitated by the tool, not in some sort of contest with it, to its, to its UI, to its lousy keyboard, to its multitude of shortcuts, to its personalized advertising. You, as manifesting yourself, seeking to write that chapter, you should be uh, all well against the, the, the blank wall. Um, so from Harper, the question persists and indeed grows whether the computer will make it easier or harder for human beings to know who they really are, to identify their real problems and to respond more fully to beauty, to place adequate value on life and to make their world safer than it now is. I think, uh, you know, I kind of contend that we've actually constructed a disaster in terms of the UI, UX, we sometimes call it, don't we, user experience of the modern computer environment. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, things then, a uh, lot of um, science we can begin to put behind this, but I just uh, maybe try and clinch that kind of argument over email as a particularly nasty uh, uh, middle piece in this messy, messy jigsaw. Um, email, uh, I would contend, is not efficient. What email is, is cheap to start. It has a low transaction cost to start an email. Um, if, I, if I'm uh, uh, worried about something, I have some concern, then an email is the cheapest place in terms of starting. I can just start sending a message to somebody and I don't need to locate that person or have them on the end of a phone or to have visited them in an office. So it's the cheapest way of me relieving some immediate uh, anxiety or some immediate maybe just call it concern, is by typing an email. An email is cheap to, to start in transaction cost terms, but actually is a long form communication. So it's expensive to finish. Um, your uh, discussion held with a colleague over email might take you three or four rounds of 20 minute message writing. Uh, whereas, uh, as we know uh, from our own personal experience, one phone call might have, have solved it uh, in, in three minutes, in four minutes maybe. But that phone call is harder to start, has a higher transaction cost at the, the start, even though it has a lower transaction cost overall. So email is kind of seductive in this, res in this respect, that it operates with a very low uh, starting price. And therefore, we, we tend to utilize it. But email, as I said before, is a kind of soft contracting. It introduced, introduces contracts and in a, in a given modern 
work environment of some competition and some, uh, some value insecurity, contracts then induce further contracts. It, it begins to change the nature of the workplace from a, may, what may have been a kind of collegiate environment to one of contracting. And I would actually argue that the, with the decline, for example, of the departmental office in, the, in universities, we've seen uh, universities go from um, collegiate environments or, or um, seeking to be collegiate environments to kind of contracting environments as people offset risk against each other through messages passed. Meantime, we're spending a lot of time uh, on, the, on these devices, more, more time than I ever dreamed of uh, in my, my life. You know, I can actually remember saying to a fellow student at one stage that I found it pretty exciting to turn on my computer in the lab. I, uh, not anymore. <laughs> uh, now, now it's uh, well past that stage and, and it's, um, uh, you know, I, I find it uh, nerve wracking to turn it off. But um, the web wants to distract you. Um, and worth noting from uh, Daniel Levitin's book of 2014, The Organized Mind, that actually when you look at those distractions that I tried to describe before, they cost us a lot in, in terms of neurological processing. They cost us a lot of energy fundamentally. And on average, if we are distracted by an interruption, maybe an email, a message, a ping, um, you know, a kind of um, a Teams call arriving, and we are in some sort of full flow writing our report, we're writing our report and then a message comes in, then once we have dispensed with that message and gone back to our original task, it will take the brain about 25 minutes to have fully recalibrated itself to, to full focus on the task, equivalent to the point at which we left it. So we kind of come down a kind of curve of processing with the sudden interruption, and it takes us quite a long time, 25 minutes, um, to, to recalibrate the brain to the full focus that we had before. And there's some other startling facts in, in um, Levitin's book, such as even knowing that an email is waiting for you lowers your IQ. Basically, you have to engage in a kind of process of controlling your own temptation to go and look at that other email. People explain it through fight and flight and other, other things, but basically the stimuli of an email carries with it a kind of um, emotional response, which is basically saying to you, I might be important, I might be important. So you know your email is there and you are telling yourself, oh no, that email is not important. I must complete this task. I want to write my report. I want to write my paper. I want to write my novel. That email doesn't matter. But that conflict lowers your IQ. Very different to the library at Trinity or, or the Quad, uh, in the, in the, in the um, writing room at New College, Oxford. We've gone into this kind of new world of contested attention. And uh, again, within um, Levitin's book, um, uh, you know, he argues that we've gone sub-goldfish in terms of our kind of twitch speed, our attention span. Um, uh, the years 2000 to 2012, the attention span of adults fell from 12 seconds, 12 seconds on the task before the, having to res resist the temptation to switch task to 8.25 seconds. The goldfish can build, beat us, um, according to his data, at nine seconds. So it's that kind of uh, control point. Should, should I stay on task? Should I switch? Should I stay on task? That kind of bell is ringing now every 8.25 seconds, whereas it was 12 seconds uh, just 20 years ago. Um, the situation becomes more and more complex because um, it's, it's non-linear. When our brain is over, overtaxed, uh, you know, when it's been stimulated by a lot, you've probably recognized this actually, when you've had a lot of messages come through, when you've had a lot of um, uh, interruptions, then you tend to get more distracted by the next interruption. In other words, your brain has, um, in, in my kind of... Um, inelegant kind of uh, description, but your brain has, has calibrated itself for an interrupted environment and starts to, to hop to the next task, to the next task, to the next task, because it's been interrupted. Oh, by the way, at nine o'clock that morning, you sat down intending to write that chapter, but by now you're just swapping tasks, because when our brain is overtaxed, overtaxed we find distractions more distracting. 
it becomes a kind of nonlinear uh, environment. Then if we switch and we begin to look at it um, uh, uh, from another perspective, a kind of a political and uh, a sociological perspective, maybe um, uh, looking at the work of Bella, he argues that this attention in which we are now engaged is a form of visual labor. We are actually um, participating in one of the world's most lucrative industries for much of this problem area. It's not all of it, from, but for much of it, we are participating in one of the world's most lucrative industries, and that is advertising. And our attention then is a form of visual labor, a form of participation in that industry, but uh, something that we obviously give away for free because we have, have no choice about it. Um, you know, it is in their commercial interest to distract you and to grab your attention for seconds, minutes, uh, or milliseconds. It's in your interests to try and uh, avoid that. Bella um, uh, calls this kind of visual labor the newest source of value production under capitalism today. Um, the firms that we have in, in, in the world today are the most valuable in terms of um, firm valuation that we've ever had. And uh, many of them are actually funded fundamentally by uh, advertising, uh, 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 Google being, a, or Alphabet rather being a, perhaps an obvious example, or Facebook, something like this. And so we, um, you know, more than uh, automotive firms or, or even oil companies or banks in the past, modern super value, value firms are um, reliant on advertising and have turned this into a kind of industrial process. So in Bella's conception, reality in our modern economy itself becomes organized around the production of a cinematic form of attention, resulting in attention being both a finite and exchangeable commodity, as well as a necessary relation offering access to others in the, world, in the real world. And just to unpick this a little bit, what's really interesting here is what he's saying about a cinematic form of attention. Um, Different to the experiences um, of uh, Virginia, Virginia Woolf uh, in the park in, in Bloomsbury, or to um, uh, Albert Einstein walking the campus at Princeton, the cinematic form of attention is structured. It's, it's organized in a way in which it is seeking to consciously guide you into different states. The idea of it being something like a film where there has been some expertise applied to bring you in, to, to motivate some movement, maybe of the eyes or of the thinking, and then some sort of productive release. That's the kind of world of advertising, for example, personalized advertising, that, that uh, or even just the configuration of the screens in front of you on the computer, is that they're trying to organize you into a kind of what Bella would call a cinematic mode, a cinematic form of attention, rather than a naturalistic and spontaneous mode that you might have encounter in the park in, in Bloomsbury. There's a, there's a structuring mechanism being introduced and, it, and it's teaching you to think and to respond in a different way. This cinematic uh, organization of attention yields a situation in which attention in all forms imaginable and yet to be imagined is that necessary, the big word, cybernetic relation to the socius, the totality of the social. So um, what, what Bella is fundamentally saying here is that uh, design or be, or be designed, design or be designed, the, the, the world of, of these structures, of these digital structures, digital structures of attention will design your attention, design your thinking for you. So we've kind of got that choice, program or be programmed, um, design or, or be designed by the kind of modern condition of the work environment on your computer, your smartphone, of course, and even the city street with all of its billboards and presentations as you try uh, to motor your thinking uh, along it. Uh, a design or be, or be designed. So attention itself, kind of human condition, is that attention, um, maybe we could um, go back to the, the development of the city itself and the way in which it, it, it came about and then how we transferred our kind of thinking from the urban structure to the kind of digital structures. The metaverse is next, of course, uh, an even deeper encounter uh, with the digital world. 
and how we've kind of moved away from from that kind of spontaneous um, encounters with stimuli into this ever more structured cinematic form of attention um, uh, as we've moved into this kind of technological age. So attention itself is being designed, but by other interests than our own. And Stiegler makes this point that actually the kind of attention that, that then the commercial interests want to see is a kind of vanilla attention. What, what people be behind these technologies want to do is to generate one particular um, form of attention. And, that, and that's the one that's most associated to consumption. To get you into that kind of um, hormonal response mode where you might buy those things that you wouldn't otherwise buy. You know, get you a little bit jumpy, a little bit excited, um, a little bit distracted, get you to buy. And uh, this is kind of hyper socialization of attention through which the increase in collaboration among the programming industries to capture audiences leads to the detriment of deep attention. We've come a long way from the library. So to begin to wrap up is that of essence, the attention economy is an inquiry into a set of social relations that follow from the realization that information is actually abundant We've constructed a world in which information is now abundant, potentially surfeit, cheap, and not politically neutral. And so it, it is not information that is the problem, but attention that is the problem. Attention is scarce and problematic. And it's, it's what Krogan and Kinsley call an inversion of the information economy. Some of you might have spotted that a lot of this goes back to Herbert Simon and his very prescient observation back in 1971 that the wealth of information as, as we build more and more information we begin to organize that in, in more and more ways the wealth of information means a dearth of something else a scarcity of whatever it is that information consumes what information consumes is rather obvious it consumes the attention of its recipients and then the clinching line hence a wealth of information creates a, pro a poverty of attention, a poverty of attention, you know, to, to, to lose that focus, to lose that productive focus, to lose that um, productive focus that we used to spend so much time and effort to try and nurture into life in, in uh, libraries, quads, uh, buildings, office environments, and so on. Uh, now to see it as so cheap, this attention, that we can afford to sacrifice it and just move on, next task, next task, next task. What is being lost? Something must be lost. And it becomes a kind of goodbye. Uh, again, I will finish in two minutes, but a goodbye to the library, the quad, and even the home. Uh, we've got into this kind of crisis between work and leisure, crisis between forms of attention. What are our brains actually good at? And a kind of problematic ownership of our cognitive selves. We have to fight, in Zuboff's words, to preserve, preserve our, our own future tense, our, our own completion of a task which we set ourselves. So we can kind of um, successfully um, uh, consider this as a design problem and open up a problematic area arising from digitization. We can see new patterns of how attention is shared among and consumed by informational de devices. And, and although it seems unfamiliar um, to kind of follow the logic and to think of attention as itself rising in price. Following Marazzi, 2008, maybe you should ask your spouses, partners, families about that. Has your attention become um, uh, increasingly contested? And are your spouses, partners, families having to increasingly work to gain your attention in a family setting, for example? Um, so, uh, maybe it's helpful to say that attention is in some ways designed, that we, that we are actually being designed by our tools, the software and the organizations behind them. And it's a case of, in a sense, design or be designed. So provisionally, I would say to finish that informa when information, to reconsider information at the heart of this, this uh, information becomes itself, becomes information when a human being is in a state, an optimal state to receive it in a way that that person considers to be conducive to his or her interests. We get back to a productive information economy 
when we think about the state of that which is going to receive and utilize that information as much as the provision of the information itself. And we should start this kind of inquiry and this thinking by thinking but with the probably with the point that the most natural state of digital information must be nil. Anything we are seeking to add to the, to the uh, human being uh, who is potentially a recipient and ut utilizer of information, uh, um, we should add only when we know it is conducive to that um, human being's productive task. And so uh, active assembly of information, our actual ability to assemble information and to provide it conducively only follows from that point. Again, coming back to Zuboff and Sartre, we need to respect the will to will, the production of, of, the, uh, of the constructive day, the production of the, of the magical day where people feel that they get things done and they accomplish what they set out to do in the morning, that kind of uh, magical and precious productivity is what we should be concerned with, with rather than the oversupply of constructed and sometimes cheap and nasty uh, information of many types. Done. Peter, thank you. Um, so many questions I've written down. I, I, one came up from, from Robin in the middle there about you know, how much of this is data and how much of it's information. Um, and my alternative question was how much of this is noise and how much of it is information. So a lot of what um, we see presented to us on our screens, um, if it's distracting us from the job, is surely noise rather than information at that particular time. Yeah, so I think in, in some ways, um, separating, creating a distinction between noise and, and information um, or data and information, you know, this is a useful thing to do. And that's probably why we've, we, we've done it. But nonetheless, um, there is no, no uh, there is no um, structured way of controlling that noise of owning ourselves against that noise because we are uh, we have little or no say in what is uh, presented uh, uh, to us in the kind of say for example in the modern digital environment and if we take uh, the university environment uh, just as a kind of template as an example the office environments would do as well we've allowed um, ourselves to think of of um, attention as as as, uh, as cheap, we've allowed that to to uh, to to happen, such that we no longer invest in 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 space and calm and time. We expect a kind of productivity at the keyboard, which is a very different um, uh, model of uh, what information is, how it's cultivated, and how it uh, responds productively to the world. So, although it is useful to make these these distinctions, unless you've got then a mechanism to, to deploy the distinction in real time in your life, um, then you have no chance. You know, it all becomes, inf uh, to your brain, it's still information. It's still a, a neurological cost. That's cool. So any, any quick questions for Peter? Do you want to one share, Peter, so we can see more happy faces? And Malcolm's got a question for you. Thank yeah, you. it's um, it's basically, a, uh, I suppose it's a question for Peter, but also just for the, the general group, really. <clears throat> basically, I don't know whether I'm an outlier here, but for me, email 25 years ago was a complete saviour, and I actually still love it. Now, it may be because I'm actually weirdly phobic about the telephone. And when basically I did used to be in local government and you had to drop everything to answer the phone. Nothing was more disruptive. When you mentioned about this 25, 30 minutes to get back in the zone, six well-placed telephone calls wrote off a day. Now I can actually use email as a messaging device. In other words, it transferred the power to me. Instead of someone interrupting, I answer it now in my own time. And the point about contract, I think, is really interesting, because let me just give you a very personal example. Uh, no big deal here, but about six months ago, my father died. Now, I've had to deal with a lot of weirdness over this, and some organizations like the banks simply cannot deal with phone calls if there's the slightest little bit of complication. So by putting it in writing in an email, 
it acted as a contract I could use for future reference. And I've actually already made 300 quid in compensation through formal complaints. So to an extent, right, this is more just a counterpoint to what you're saying. Isn't it not so much the technology, but how you use it? So in other words, if someone emails me, I don't respond. I respond in my own time because it's a messaging device. And that's what utterly transformed my life 25 years ago and continues to do so. Uh, do you work for local government now, Malcolm? No, no, no. I actually work in IT, and that's another thing. <laughs> you talk about the quietness, and so no phone calls. I used to work in IT and would, could be in the zone for literally five, even six hours. No one interrupting me. Uh, another issue, again, uh, 40 years ago, I started a PhD but never wrote it. I got trapped in the portcullis of um, uh, footnotes. Only recently, I went to somewhere like Academia, e EDU, whatever, downloaded 100 articles in a morning and read all the transcripts in one go. Uh, not the transcripts, the resumes. That would have been impossible 40 years ago. So again, online, the web has transformed my life for the better. But I see, again, I have no interest. In, I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Facebook. And I think there's a sense of what you bring, in other words, the models, if you like, and your mental models, again, that you bring to the situation, the media, I think is more important than the media itself. Um, I think that one, um, yeah, I, I think that there's no simple good and bad. Um, I think that the, there is an element of McLuhan's kind of medium is the message um, about this. And um, I think that uh, in local government in the past, um, telephone was treated as kind of top of the hierarchy. You had to answer it within a certain number of rings, whereas internal memos, people could turn around in seven days and external letters in 28 days were kind of uh, local government standards. But if you think about the existence of those standards, they were there to try to control an informational stroke attentional environment. And... Um, uh, perhaps there was a wrongful primacy in that given to the telephone, uh, which I would suggest today has been replaced by email. So I, I um, agree and I also kind of caution that I think, um, I wonder if the change of role that you've had, Malcolm, is, has been um, at least as conducive to this more positive set of relations than the change yeah. of the tools. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. In, in, in that. And so... Um, I think there's something to be explored there, and I don't entirely disagree, but I think it's just, um, you know, it, it, it needs some thinking. Mm. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Malcolm. So, everybody, we're going to move on to the, to, the, to the second speaker. Peter, I think you've got to disappear at some point, but um, the longer you can hang around, the better. And I think um, uh, um, that was by no means a mean warm-up act for whatever, whatever follows. Um, I got a lot more out of it the second time round than I did the first. So that's always a, always a, always a good thing, and I, I understood it better. And I've, I've ever got three pages of questions if we run out of things to talk about at any time. Um, so thank you for that. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move on now. I must stop saying that, mustn't I? Uh, to Dr. Clement Vidal. Uh, I shall read this again. Clement is a philosopher with a background in logic and the cognitive sciences, a visiting researcher at SETI Barclay, co-founder of the Evo Devo Universe community, and authored a book called The Beginning and the End, The Meaning of Life in a Cosmological Perspective. Eager to tackle big questions, bringing together areas of knowledge, such as cosmology, physics, astrobiology, cybernetics, complexity science, and evolutionary theory, which is, you know, not a bad thing to be doing on a Wednesday afternoon when the sun's shining, um, uh, but far from simple. And so the talk is entitled Astrobiology and Cybernetics. And I think, Clement, it's probably best if you introduce your, uh, your work for yourself and then tell us what you're going to talk to us about. So, and as ever, we'll give you about half an hour. I'll start the clock now. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm sharing my screen now. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm very excited to give uh, this talk about astrobiology and cybernetics because actually I have a kind of um, broken heart. If this 
slide wants to go. Yes. So cybernetics and astrobiology are two of my of my favorite research domains, and I very rarely see them acting together or combined. And I think it's a really a huge pity because they they have so much to bring to each other. Uh, and uh, yeah, I put at the bottom two two references that do astrobiology um, by thinking in terms of systems. It's uh, Robert Freitas' book, uh, Xenology, uh, which you can find online and um, in the more social space of, uh, of um, astrobiology, um, Harrison in his book, After Contact. So as uh, the cybernetic audience knows, uh, uh, this is a quote from, from Ashby, who says in the very first page of Introduction to, to Cybernetics, Cybernetics deals with all forms of behavior and so far as they are regular or determinate or reproducible. The materiality is irrelevant. And I highlight this because obviously we don't know what kind of extraterrestrial we are going to, to find. So we should not assume any, any concrete material um, uh, substrate. So for the non-cyberneticist uh, here, I don't know if there is any, but some, um, some uh, here are some key cybernetic concepts, control, goal directedness, feedback loops, which can be reinforcing or regulating homeostasis, hierarchy, powers, um, modeling with black box, finding essential variables in systems. So, um, yes, we, you, you probably know that uh, the history of cybernetics uh, is, uh, is a bit uh, sad, but uh, because it's not that big today, but it has been taken over under the umbrella of complex systems uh, research largely, or rather cybernetic concepts have, have given birth to, to new domains that you, you can see here on, on the right, um, or influence, or cybernetics has influenced a lot of these domains. And now if we, if we go uh, if you look at the constraints in astrobiology, uh, it's first that the interac interactions of systems are very rare or expensive to, to, to get a hold on. If you think about sampling missions in the solar system, this costs billions of, uh, of dollars um, and they are complicated to, to, to do so. Um, so that's very hard to, to get a uh, hold of an interactive, potentially interacting, uh, interacting system that could uh, hold some kind of life form. Uh, many ideas are, are also nearly impossible to go on human timescales if we think of uh, interstellar communication just because of the huge distances. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's very long. And also because of these huge distances, uh, the, the systems that are further away are, are not accessible for experimentation. So we have only observations and not uh, interactions, uh, experimentations. So the question um, I was asking myself, um, and I was hoping you, you would have uh, some ideas, is what cybernetic modeling tools are most appropriate for astrobiology given these constraints. So in my own thinking, I've been uh, using a subset of systems theory, which is living system theory by, by Miller. And it basically says that all living systems have uh, 20 subsystem or need to have 20 subsystem components that, uh, that process uh, matter, energy, and information. You can see them here. And in uh, the um, in the tradition of uh, SETI, the, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence via communication messages, it's actually looking at just this uh, component 19, the output trans transducer in the terminology of living system theory which uh, in a way is very smart because that's, that's something that could be very unambiguous to, to find a, a life signature. 
but on the other hand, it neglects all the other uh, all the other processes that living systems do. It doesn't really look at them. Yeah, so astrobiology is a is a growing field, and there are basically two big strands: uh, either to look for biosignatures, so signs of biology, or technosignatures, signs of of, uh, of technology. Uh, I'm personally interested in my research in uh, technosignatures and especially finding manifestation of. Uh, intelligence engineering or via via uh, non-communication so not necessarily a message that would be sent to us but some kind of activity behavior that that would be a sign of extraterrestrial intelligence so how do we do that uh, here is a quote from freeman dyson um, in 1965 if there are millions of places in the universe where technology might develop, then we are not interested in guessing what an average technological society might look like. We have to think instead of what the most conspicuous out of a million technologies might look like. The technology which we have a chance to, de to detect is by definition one which has grown to the greatest possible extent. So. In this space, we often think uh, uh, that these are kind of uh, science fiction like ideas, but I think this is really, uh, in a way, very wrong. It's just that we want to to look for it's a it's a pragmatic constraint and something that is super uh, big and powerful, as Dyson hypothesis explains here, uh, has just more chances to be visible and observable. So what what could be the, the most um, the most impressive projects uh, that an intelligent life could have in the universe? And here is a one slide summary of of my book uh, that I need to introduce because otherwise uh, it will seem maybe obscure. So we start with uh, with uh, the, the the view that. The universe seems fine-tuned in some way to produce uh, life and complexity. And uh, this universe uh, makes life through cosmic evolution. Then it evolves to intelligent life. And then this is a very important step. Uh, it's the re realization of the second law of thermodynamics applied to the universe that all energy gradients will dissipate and that our universe will ultimately die. And so one way to uh, avoid this or to bypass this is actually to make a new universe where the thermodynamic constraints would be reset. And the way to do that would be to, to uh, use the most plentiful energy which is available in, in the galaxy, which are stars. And so I came up with this uh, Stellivore hypothesis. It's the idea that intelligent life actually eats stars uh, with the goal to, to make a new universe. And then the new universe is itself a fine tune. So what are Stellivores more, more precisely? Uh, so the Stellivore hypothesis is a, actually a reinterpretation of known accreting binary star systems where you have one bigger star uh, that here is, a, is seen as an energy source. There is an irregular flow of matter that goes, so it goes on and off and it ejects uh, entropy or via jets or novas in the case of, uh, of white dwarfs. So these systems exist uh, with uh, as a compact object uh, here that can be either a white dwarf, a neutron star, or a black hole. And so when I first saw this, and I was thinking in terms of um, the, the general definition of life, I thought, well, this might look like a metabolism. You have an external energy source, uh, a, an irregular flow of uh, energy that comes in and maybe entropy going out, out of the system. 
And so maybe this is life, maybe this is living. Uh, and I want to stress that uh, it's, it's really a tiny subset of, uh, of binary stars that I suspect could be living. Um, so we have, there are basically three kinds of um, binary stars. Either detached binaries where there is no interaction between the two stars. So these are not good living candidates. Candidates they are like two non-interacting stones. There are two stars that are, uh, there can be two stars that can be very close to each other that, that would ultimately merge into a common envelope and, and explode often. So they are like a wild uh, fire a system that will tend to equilibrium. So they are not good candidates, but there are some so-called semi-detached binaries where there is this uh, flow of, inf of uh, matter that, that, um, that goes from one star to another. So could this be living? Uh, Again, the, the, the binary stars that I'm interested in are, uh, are a tiny subset. So you can see the, the contact binaries that will go through equilibrium, the detached that don't interact, the semi-detached, we can split them to, to different uh, kinds even. The conservative ones are where the, the matter energy stays within the gravitational bond of, a, of the system. So in my view, they are not a good living candidate because you need to put entropy out of the system. So there are binaries that that there need to be binaries that eject matter out of the system, which are called non-conservative. And there are some that are persistent, where the flow is persistent. So this is not a, a good candidate either because living systems should be able to, to budget their energy flows. So it's only the so-called transient binaries that can um, switch on and off their accretion that, uh, that are uh, candidates. So the big question I've been struggling with uh, since more than 10 years now is are these systems just dissipative structures or living things? And I know many people have, uh, have thought about this uh, distinction. And I think it's here uh, a great opportunity to, to try to apply our, our models or ideas to, to test whether we are dealing with uh, just a dissipative structure or a living uh, system. So another argument that there could be living, this could be living things is just the, the, the sheer variety of them. As um, Lackey and collaborators uh, recently wrote, these sources have been practically ignored in SETI, but they are among the most powerful and dynamic objects in our galaxy. And uh, let me show you uh, some of the terminology. So they, they can be um, uh, described by, by either by the mass of the companion. Um, if they are, the companion star is a, has a low mass, it's called a low mass X-ray binary. If it has a high mass, it's a high mass X-ray binary. Uh, the white dwarfs um, in accretion are, are, are called cataclysmic variables, and there are a lot of, of, of them of different kinds. The neutron stars um also have different kinds uh, and black holes also so sometimes a picture is worse than and then a lot of this terminology so here you see white dwarf in accretion so this one doesn't have a, an accretion disk it it, ch it channels it the energy flow through extremely powerful magnetic fields uh, this one diverts the the flow of matter through uh, what's called a propeller state. This is called uh, an accretion curtain, where a strong magnetic field also um, kind of uh, push back the, the, the accretion disk and, and, and allow the, the flow to, to go inside the, the white dwarf. This is a millisecond pulsar, so a neutron star that uh, has a huge magnetic field that is able to, to stop the accretion flow. And that creates a shock that we can observe. And this is a micro quasar, so it's a black hole that accretes matter from, from a companion star. And I also want to show you this uh, picture that I didn't make. It's, uh, it's actually a, 
kind of outreach that, um, drawing that has been done to represent white dwarfs eating stars. Or, or, and indeed, uh, as you can see, the, the metaphor used is the one of, of eating. So the white dwarf comes around a, a companion star, it comes closer, it starts to, to accrete the star, it eats, and then, and then it burps, it ejects uh, some waste out. And I think it's, uh, it's very interesting that uh, oftentimes uh, it's often in outreach that uh, this analogy of eating is, uh, is used to describe the systems it's it's a kind of natural uh, analogy except uh, me i i kind of try to take it seriously so back to living systems uh the most obvious subsystems that could be here already are are the boundaries so uh, a white dwarf and neutron star or a black hole have boundaries they ingest matter from the companion star and they have an extruder, extruder, which means a system that is able to to put waste out of the system. Um, but we could go further, and uh, if we take seriously the, the the scenario of making new universes, then then uh, the, the ultimate goal would be to make a new universe. So there would be this reproducing uh, function. Um, it seems also to to convert and to and to produce new new elements, uh, and the argument here is that uh, the, the the matter that is ejected is composed of heavier elements than what is accreted, in, in, at least in in white dwarfs. So it means that it's not simply what has just been uh, accreted that is ejected, there has been some kind of transformation and it's not the explosion itself, the, the nova that, that produces these heavier elements. So it seems there has been a transformation somehow. There seems to be, uh, the storage could be the, the, the accretion disk. And we have seen also, uh, oh, Breaking news, sorry, a new exoplanet has been found with a GPS accurate down to 100 meters. So is it amazing? Wow. Is it a techno signature? Is it, could it be real? Well, uh, that's fake news. I'm sorry to disappoint you. But did you know that there is a galactic GPS accurate down to 100 meters and this uh, exists thanks to millisecond pulsars that have been accelerated uh, by, by, uh, by accreting matter from a star. So as I have a British audience, you probably know what to do, keep calm and carry on. It's just nature. But is it? Uh, and I wrote a paper to, to ask the question whether this um, this galactic GPS could have been engineered. And just very briefly, the, the idea to navigate with millisecond pulsars is to look at least at uh, four of them. And since they all have different periods and different signatures, we can, it's possible to disambiguize and uh, the position by by looking at several of them. So the more pulsars, the more the the position, uh, the less position are, are possible in the in the intersection. So it, it works pretty much like um, tree laterization and the algorithms to find the, the position in, in space with millisecond pulsars are almost the same as the ones used by our global navigation satellite systems. And yes, again, the, those uh, millisecond pulsars that are super stable in the signal that is sent and uh, super fast also, they have been accelerated in a, in a binary system like, like, like this one. So um, the, the discussion I want to, to open are on these three questions that, that uh, we came across. 
The first one is what cybernetic modeling tools are most appropriate for astrobiology. The second one is about the stellivore hypothesis at large. Are these dissipative or living systems and how can we test that? And finally, about the pulsar positioning system. Is it natural or has it been engineered? How, how could cybernetic help to, to see if we are dealing with a system that has been engineered, that is being controlled somehow? And, or maybe even if it's natural, uh, is it being, being used by other extraterrestrials? So I thank you for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Okay, so thank you, Clement. Um, I think it might be useful at some point to put the questions back up um, so we can sort of circle back to them and make sure we at least have a good stab at answering them. Um, I've written a whole load of stuff down, but I, I took first go after Peter, so I'm going to... Um, I know, Ben, you, you, you clapped your hands, which is good. Nice to see you, Ben, by the way, so I didn't say hello earlier. Um, who's got a question or a suggestion, thoughts they'd like to come in with? with Clement, please. Unmute yourself and speak. David, you're on mute. You're mute. It's you're muted. Uh, no, no, we working. try again to unmute. We can't hear you, David. Oh, you have a microphone problem, I guess, with your uh, configuration. And mute, and mute, and mute, and it should work. And mute, I think it should work. If you, I'll yes, go ahead. Hi, David. Speak. He can't hear us, so we'll go to Ben, and we'll come back I... in, in a little minute. Ben, stick your hand up. You got your hand up, so yeah. Okay, uh, Clement, thank you so much. Um, I just had a couple of like maybe the obvious responses to the which kind of model question. So you might have, uh, these are like the ones that spring first to mind. So and they go in different directions. So the first one would be autopoasis, which I think in the early papers has some very quite strict criteria, which I don't know much about, but someone else on the call might do. Um, but sort of before it gets kind of analogized into our, you know different domains, but it was a sort of very strict set of criteria that are kind of cellular in how they apply. And I think that would be quite interesting kind of set of criteria to take. And the second one I thought of was from Bateson, which is like sort of sends you in completely the, the different world. So I think Bateson would kind of think of the stars as being living to the extent in which they deal with information. So he's kind of takes life in a very different direction where, um, Basically, the living systems is is anything that is dealing in the world of information and ideas and difference, um, as opposed to matter and energy. So, I guess the question there would be: to what extent does the to what extent is eating a star an informational um, activity rather than an energetic one? Which is maybe a different way of looking at it. So, they're the things that came to my mind. Thank, thanks for um, thanks to the presentation. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Um, yes, indeed. I mean, regarding autopoiesis, that's, uh, that's a, a project also in the back of my mind is to, is to develop something like, uh, artificial to, to explore whether, uh, nuclear reactions could create this kind of autopoiesis, autopoiesis. I don't think there is a particular reason why only chemical reactions uh, should, should be able to do that. Um, and if we think about what we can do today with nuclear uh, forces, it's, it's two things. It's bombs and energy, which are very primitive uh, kind of systems that we manage. Uh, and even a bomb is, is not really a complicated system. It's just a positive feedback that, that blows up. Um, and, and so I suspect that, uh, that indeed a lot of autopoiesis structure organization could be made out of, uh, big sets of nuclear reactions 
it it seems counterintuitive to us because we associate this with destruction and with something dangerous for life as we know it but um i think it's uh, it's plausible and yes regarding information uh, yes i agree it's key and i've been wondering with by looking at all this matter energy behavior and processes would that be ever enough to to find a kind of proof that these are living things and in a way the the pulsar positioning system is the only information uh subsystem that 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 applies to to steady boards because uh it's it's a timing subsystem it provides a timing for the galaxy that is very accurate and reliable and it's uh timing is a, is a key thing for living systems uh, whether it's a biological clock or, or for society to have a, a common time to synchronize uh, coordinate etc so it's really critical to to any living thing or organization so if i could come in there Clement, and ask and i might have missed it because i was writing some frantic notes at the beginning um are you define how are you defining the, this wonderful word life so that you're what do you mean by a living system yes uh <clears throat> So, while, while Clement actually thinks about that, <laughs> I, I, I've just posted a question in the in the text because I wasn't actually sure, felt confident enough to ask it, but now it seems relevant. Has anyone comes across Hans Weyen, Weyhinger's idea of as if, the philosophy of as if? And so I'm thinking, is there an idea of if the universe acts as if it's alive, then can we conclude it is alive? Yes. Well, um, yes, I, I guess, I mean, my, my answer is that is uh, has been from shifting away from definitions of life to uh, theories of life. So a theory should be able to make retrodictions and predictions. So I think that that's a, that's a game in the end. Uh, uh, it, it's to be able to make new predictions that are that um, non living models wouldn't make and and if there are more predictions that are validated and more explanations of past uh, behavior that uh, that are more naturally made using living models versus non-living models then the, the living models would have to be preferred so i i'm i'm not religious with any definition of life i rather have a good theory of life that that makes good predictions and Yes, that would be that would be my answer. But what is life? I, I think just to sort of go on from that as an analogy, uh, about five years ago, I went to a presentation at SIO Systems and Complexity in Organizations, and I, I'm pretty sure it was Angus. I don't know whether he's here today. No, I don't think he is. But I'm pretty sure it was Angus that did a presentation that more or less argued that the business, the organization, any kind of institution, is alive, and um, I mean, it's five years ago, so I'm only half thinking of it. But for me, I could only basically process that in my own mind by using this idea of as if it's alive. I think the, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a reification that goes on, Malcolm, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. we, we observe a system in dynamic interaction with other systems mm -hmm. and we can describe it as having a life. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. We also can, can um, and, and so when we, we start to think about that, um, we particularly when you look at organizations it's the human beings that give it the life they're with a source of the energy so you take the human beings out of the organization it, you know, it, it, it's no longer there well well it, it, it in in a sense but I, i've only just finished reading andrew pickering's book the cybernetic brain sketches of a new future and quite frankly i found it stunning i found it absolutely wonderful and his idea of a dance of agency which seems to sort of like go to this idea that anything that has some kind of complex interaction has agency, whether we like it or not. And that then begs a question. I don't think he ever uses the word life, but it begs a question of what is the relationship between agency and life? 
So, so Fenton Robin, 1990, mm. wrote about suprahuman autopoietic systems. Oh, and lovely quite, phrase. <laughs> he, he described, um, he described mm. accounting as yeah. an example, yeah, as a yeah. suprahuman autopoietic system. And what he was describing was, was a system um, displaying autopoietic uh, characteristics, um, which was at least in principle beyond human control. And mm. I thought it's Jonathan Randall's here, so we'll talk about things mm. being beyond human control. Um, uh, and it, it, in, in describing the, the mechanisms of accounting um, are maybe too big for us to, to actually mm -hmm. interfere mm -hmm. with or inhibit. Mm -hmm. And if you look at an organization, we'll, we'll take it, we talk about universities when, when Peter was speaking, or you talk about, for example, the NHS, you have a system which has created, developed mm -hmm. an energy of its own. Yeah. Um, and which yeah. is in principle beyond human control to intervene in and and make any difference to. So you could, on that basis, argue that the NHS is alive yeah. on its own terms. I think also as well is that you see when you just mentioned something before, do we and is this just being very human centric, anthropomorphic, so to speak? Do we inherently think of life as being tightly coupled with some kind of ethical dimension? In other words, right, can something be alive as if it's alive with no ethics whatsoever? Well, it'll have an ethic of its own, but we won't do <laughs> it. David, do you want to try speaking again? If not, I shall ask your question for you. No, it's not clearly not working today. So David's put, um, so, David asks, is the only plausible alternative to design the Goldilocks universe a massively perpetually proliferating, I can't even say the words, perpetually proliferating multiverse of which life as we know it is a random or rare special case? Yes, indeed. Uh, well, it's not the only, it's not the only uh, alternative, but it's one of the big alternative of uh, often promoted by cosmologists that there is actually a huge multiverse with all kinds of different parameters and and we just happen to be in the one that that produces life and complexity and that it's a selection effect but it's if you think two min two minutes about it it's a it's an outrageous assumption even even more outrageous than what uh, i'm arguing uh, with all my speculations because you you have to assume the uh, real existence of a huge multiverse with all these parameters and 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 it's you can it's not an explanation it's uh you you, you could explain anything with that it's a uh, uh, so it's really a cop out, and and then the, another another alternative explanation is of course uh, a supernatural god that would have fine tuned our, our universe, which I think today would be the if I were a theologian I would I would push on this argument and not on the origin of life or humans because evolutionary theory has already explained so much towards this path. So the, the, the real mystery that remains is really at the, at the beginning of the universe. Um, sorry to bust in, um, but you bust in by all means. this is, uh, um, the, the, these, are, these stellar objects are too hot to be living. You cannot build, um, you know, structures within these stellar objects you cannot lay down memory or you can't, they cannot, you know, actively move or perform actions on their environment. They are purely passive, entirely dissipative, and there is absolutely no evidence for there being anything structured, living or laid down within them. Um, it's, you know, there may, but, you know, they may eventually produce something that produces a universe, you know, by pure physical means, you know, they produce a black hole, they might by, by pure chance produce another universe or another set of universes um, on the other side of that, of that black hole. But these dissipative structures have, there's no evidence there's anything living going on within them at all. They're just going downhill from high energy to low energy, and there are no structures and no, nothing laid down or permanent within them that 
represent anything at all to do with living living um, beings. Uh, under you know these aren't these are purely physical that waterfalls. They're purely physical, um, entirely high energy to entropy systems that have got no informational structure in them whatsoever. Um, so I'm afraid I'm deeply skeptical about this whole approach. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for articulating this so clearly. Uh, okay, uh, I can go through some of your objections. So the too hot objection, I think, um, I think it's based on the assumption of life as we know it. And uh, although it's a, a, of a different scale, we have we have seen we have discovered extremophiles that that can survive a very extreme environments uh, that we wouldn't yeah, have. They're, they're, they are, they can, but they but they survive environments within cool systems like the Earth. This isn't something. This isn't about ten thousand degrees centigrade. This is about things that are a few hundred degrees hot. You know, you can't build a memory inside molten magma, and that's perfect. That's these things are much much hotter than that. Right, right, right. It's another realm. I completely agree. Uh, no, oh, well, if, if you agree, then you should. Uh, then you Alan, should follow Alan, to the can, Alan, Alan, can we see you? Uh, or, or maybe you could just let uh, the, uh, your question be answered because you know um, you've asked a question. I'd like to hear the answer. Okay, so so yes, so, so I was as I was replying to to Ben earlier, uh -huh. uh, what what I assume for for this kind of extremely high energy, extremely hot regime for for life to 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 be possible in in this uh, situation. Uh, indeed, I need to assume that life would be on a totally would be thriving on nuclear reactions rather than just chemical reactions, and and that it would have changed it. It's uh, either yes, life would have evolved directly in binary stars, or, or it would have changed its uh, substrate, much in the same way as the if you think of the universal. During machines, the, the very definition of what is a computer allowed to create many different hardware implementations of what is a, a physical computer. And so my, I imagine that an advanced civilization has kind of really cracked what is life, what are the, 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 the general principles of life, and is able to implement it in chemical reactions, in nuclear reactions. Or maybe other substrates even. So, so temperature for me is uh, is really not uh, something that 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 should be a focus. But I, I completely agree. The the the, uh, the burden of proof is on is on my side uh, of when I claim that this is possible. I, uh, I mean, it's it's work that remains to be done to see whether nuclear reactions could indeed um, create complexity. Uh, then you said uh, that these systems don't move. That's that's wrong. There are many binary star systems that move uh, and quickly in the galaxy. So that's uh, an interesting feature also. Uh, <coughs> you said they are passive. Uh, for me, the, and, and you gave this interesting waterfall analogy. And it's funny you gave it because I actually use it in my, in my um, work. And uh, the way I see it is that th this flow of energy starts and stops. So if you would see a, a waterfall that starts and stops, uh, wouldn't you be intrigued a little bit? Is it a hydroelectric power station or is it just a natural, uh, a natural waterfall? Well, when, when it, I mean, the, the flow stops and starts, that, that's, that's what's intriguing. I agree if the flow were entirely continuous all the time. This is clearly a dissipative passive structure, but here the flow changes. So it is yeah, but does it change? Does it change in a regular fashion um, or does it just change on a random basis? No, it's rather regular. Uh, it, it can, the time scales vary from um, a few years to decades. Uh, yeah.
Yeah, so that would be. Alan, is there a brief response? Um, because we've got other people with their hands up waiting to speak. So, any any more comments? That's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Margaret. You've had your hand up a while. You're currently on mute. We can't hear you. We still can't hear you. I have a question about black holes. Can okay. you hear me? Yeah, yes, right. we can. So um, I've learned that the latest um, theories around the black hole behavior is that they actually, in swallowing space time, excuse my words, and the process is basically that they actually implode matter and energy and they extrude these radiation um, plumes. And within that radiation plume, there is a theory that says that all the information relating to what was consumed resides in those radiation plumes. So the theory is, uh, is all lost or is everything that was before contained, you know, in that um, radiation plume and goes back into structuring the universe. <laughs> the engines of our galaxies, they actually seem to be the Organize the creation hubs, if you like. So they consume and create at the same time. So I find that quite fascinating. Yes, well, uh, so I must emphasize that uh, in the steady war hypothesis, it's only stellar black holes that I'm interested in. So not supermassive black holes that are at the center of galaxies. Um, but indeed, they have. Uh, somehow similar behavior but uh, for me they are, they are interesting because they are there would be a kind of control case that i would suspect that uh, smaller stellar black holes would behave differently from a supermassive black hole that would be more like a, a dissipative uh, structure in this case uh, and and regarding the question of information um, I would be very careful about these uh, theories of information processing by black holes and uh, part of it is that I'm not sure I understand them completely and uh, also because it's, uh, it's a realm of, of, uh, of nature that, oh, well, the, theor the models, they combine quantum mechanics with relativity theory, which is really a not trivial thing to do and and so, um, and yeah, I, uh, I guess, yes, I don't know how you would, uh, reconstruct information from, from the jets of a supermassive black hole, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's interesting theoretical research. Thanks very much. And, uh, Peter Cochran, you've been waiting a while. And how uh, it Peter? I'd like to make a, just a couple of observations. The first one is that uh, the AI community have uh, fallen foul of uh, using human beings as the gold standard for the last 70 years. Um, and in the last decade, we've discovered that uh, uh, all life forms uh, do exhibit intelligence, and it starts with a single cell. Uh, everything is made from RNA, DNA, and um, and so uh, there are even relationships between trees where the communication medium happens to be fungus. Now, what what the problem is here is, uh, first of all, uh, the notion of uh, speciated uh, superiority, where we're number one uh, on the planet. Well, I have to tell you, if you go to the deep ocean and put a human being there, they're no longer superior you find other other life forms are and, and uh, uh, each life form is for, formed by uh, the given environment so uh, things like uh, belief and ethics are purely human constructs uh, plants don't have any ethics and they don't have any belief systems as far as we know so i, I want to quote you uh, Werner, uh heisenberg uh, and uh, this really to me sums up uh, the situation uh, the universe is far more complex than we thought. In fact, it's far more complex than we can think. And um, you know, if you, uh, I've got deep into AI uh, and artificial life, and um, 
I, I, there, are, there are sort of interesting things, uh, programs of people trying to understand the human brain, and yet uh, the application of uh, thermodynamics quickly shows that no matter how many human brains you have trying to unpick the human brain, you're never going to understand anything. And in actual fact, we are totally dependent now on uh, creating tools uh, like AI, and uh, if we can ever get it working, supercomputing, and then we might crack some of these uh, problems. But on, on the issue uh, of what is life, uh, the simplest, um, the simplest uh, definition I've come across is uh, life is anything that creates positive entropy. So when I when I uh, look at the energy levels uh, in, in these black holes and uh, these uh, stars and, and what have you, I, I just see uh, a boiling turmoil. I don't I don't see a mechanism for it to settle down into some kind of positively entropic state or organized state. You know, the only thing, as far as we know, that creates uh, order in this universe is life. Nothing else does that. Um, so I'm, I'm intrigued uh, as to where uh, uh, this is going. And, and I'm, uh, I'm intrigued as to where the experimental evidence is coming from. Uh, to support some of the uh, the hypotheses, and um, it, it seems to me that the the sphere is more or less somewhere about year uh, sixty years ago, uh, where people were thinking of AI. It, it's really in its infancy, and I don't I don't um, criticise guessing because it's a very powerful scientific technique, um, but ultimately uh, we have to get some kind of proof. So I wonder if you could comment on what experiments do we have? What scientific proof do we have? Or, or is this just um, uh, intellectual uh, exercise at, at the moment? And, and by the way, I, I, this is not meant as a criticism. I, I applaud it. To, you know, think, thinking out of the box on any topic is, 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 good, is good as far as I'm concerned. But I do yearn for some kind of evidence here. Sure, uh, and so am I. I mean, and and not even evidence. I'm. I. I also have doubts personally. So I, I don't know if, whether these uh, systems are, are dissipative or living. I, I want. I really want to find out. Um, and so yes, regarding evidence. Uh, um, the, the, the phenomenology is well studied, so we know this, um, this is accreting systems, we know they stop accreting, they start again, uh, we know that they have a strong magnetic field that can channel accretion, uh, so all this is well studied and well known, although it's uh, because it comes from astrophysics and astronomy, it's uh, just to to, to get some inform of this information and models is, is, is already an intellectual feat. Um, can, I, can I give you a straw to clutch on? <laughs> but um, the evidence now from at least one asteroid is that um, the nucleic acids to create NRA, RNA and DNA are actually everywhere in the universe. Yes, I know that's exciting. Yeah, you know, I mean, this, these are, it, it's been true of uh, meteorites. We've known from meteorites, but there's always this, uh, oh, well, it's probably got contaminated argument. But now um, there's evidence that uh, asteroids have got uh, those acids. So it, it, you know, the first statement might be. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, the, I mean, the components of life are everywhere. Yes, to to try to answer your question, I'm I'm trying to to hope to find models or evidence of, uh, for example, the, the the patterns of energy intake and entropy or and the jets or explosions uh, 
what the ratio of what's taken in and out, the energy budgeting uh, usage. How, how could this be modeled in a, with, with like living systems tools? Uh, it's just a dynamic energy budgeting or other models that, that would tell you how much uh, waste product uh, versus how much is, uh, energy is used and to see if, uh, if this fits uh, with, uh, with this kind of super macroscopic uh, potentially living things. Uh, so, uh, or whether this could, there could be some other goal directed behavior that we, we could see. And why, why, why does life have to be microscopic? Why can't it be microscopic? I said macro, uh, I said macroscopic. Yes. Oh, sorry. My ears. Yes. Thank you, pardon. yes that's, I mean, um, Bizarrely, you're making me think that we could, um, model some of this using using um, economic models of, of productivity and, and I wouldn't say efficiency, but you know, the conversion of one thing into another and measuring yield at the end. And I, I don't know what the hell we'd measure, but um, you know, it's that sort of, you're looking for tools, it's that sort of explanatory or descriptive model that might help you get to a way of, of addressing Peter's scientific sort of, where's the evidence? question and um, maybe challenging Alan's uh, proposition around you uh, and I think Aaron you mentioned it as well the, other, the, the unbelievably high temperatures that we require to make these things happen um, so yeah there's something interesting in there Malcolm you've had your hand up a while yeah uh, I'd just like to ask I suppose two questions if I may one is um, I suppose specifically to Clement uh, has he um, uh, come across well I suppose he must in the field Lee Smolan's idea of cosmological evolution? And if so, can he explain it? But the basic idea behind it, the supplementary question to this is, and I think this is more for the group as a whole, isn't there a tight coupling then between evolution and life? Cannot, does evolution only rarely exist when it's on life? So if the, cosmo, if the cosmos evolves, then is it alive? That was actually one and Sub question. The second question, because I'd like to sort of almost bring it back to Peter. Unfortunately, he's gone. But can we think of the internet in the way Peter described it earlier as being alive? Um, yeah. So about Lee Smolin's cosmological natural selection. Yes, I studied it uh, closely, and actually, the the thesis of my book is to 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 make a variation out of it and to what I call cosmological artificial selection instead of natural selection. So so the idea of cosmological natural selection is that um, that uh, a, uni a universe um, produces black holes and these black holes produce new universes and therefore the our universe is fine tuned. Uh, through many generations to produce more and more black holes. And, um, but what lacks in this theory is a mechanism for heredity. How would information from uh, one universe be given to another one? And, and that's where, uh, and, and also it's totally agnostic or doesn't speak about life and intelligence and complexity. And so the idea is to, you know, with cosmological artificial section is to modify this and say that super intelligent life in the very far future would be able to tweak to some degree the, the, the making of a new universe and therefore make fertile universe. And, and that would be the kind of ultimate uh, game of life uh, in the universe. And so in this model, uh, yes, I would say, uh, that's, that's the ultimate uh, stretch of the biological worldview it is to say that the universe as a whole is alive. Yes, it, it had a birth in the Big Bang. It, it's, uh, it's developing. It's not evolving, actually. It's, it's a kind of development because if there is just one universe, at least in this universe, it's a developmental sequence. And, and it's going to die through heat death because energy gradients will disappear. And one way to to reset and to continue something 
is to, to create a new universe, to make a new universe uh, from this one. So I think this, um, of course, it's it's uh, speculative, but I think it's uh, it's an attracting. Uh, are, you, are you suggesting, come on, that the, the universe is acting with intent? Uh, no, through through intelligent life only, I would say. So we have to come back to what the the, the definition of life we struggled with a little earlier on. I, I think this is a very profound point because you raised it in my presentation about nine months ago. Because I think we had a disagreement. I don't yeah. think life ne necessarily entails intent. So this becomes, I think, quite a profound cybernetic spoke systems idea, but also a wider philosophical viewpoint of how you look at the world. So, yeah, so describing describing a dynamical system and the, and the, the flows mm -hmm. of, of energy or information, if you prefer, um, mm -hmm. around a dynamical system is it, very, very descriptive. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's kind of our description. It belongs to the observer rather than yeah. the thing that's observed. Uh, and that's where I'm sort of intrigued by mm -hmm. um, you know, what do we mean by life and, and consequently, because uh, I can observe dynamical yeah, systems. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Is, isn't the uh, isn't the isn't the cybernetical goal life itself, survival, longevity, continuity, negantropy? I would say it's survival. Yes, it's uh, uh, it's survival of the whole, of of something of not even of this universe because it will die. It's of the process. It's uh, it's uh, the, uh, the, the when making a new universe uh, I mean I've, I've uh, uh, explored this uh, question more philosophically but the the kind of immortality that a super advanced civilization would be longing for would be to 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 have the evolutionary process continue somewhere and not necessarily uh, survive itself that, that it would probably die in the hit death anyway but it would have made a, an offspring at least knowing that something continues yeah so so the, the what you just said earlier you said that uh you know that that this life continues um in, in a certain way of order until it's all until it's going to be totally in entropic entropic state for a while but that human beings have the information really as the energy to move that matter in a sustainable way for the longest period as possible that we have that ability of consciousness to do that. And I think that is the connection that maybe this, you know, uh, sometimes the uh, science can't really prove, but uh, is there. Yes, but uh, the, so the, I think the, the, the constraint is, is when we start to think ultimately, like in the extremely, extremely long term, okay, we might, um, use all the stars in the galaxy maybe even go to other uh, to other galaxies and all this energy but the the heat death is really dreadful because everything would uh, dissipate so uh, there are, there are not that many options to have something continue um, while there is the uh, the, the interesting um, conformal cyclical cosmology by Roger Penrose who says that at the heat death actually uh, the state of the universe would be like like the state of the early universe and that actually a new universe could a uh, new new structures could could appear again uh, it's intriguing but uh, uh, yeah I don't intuitively buy it but uh, it's an intriguing argument yeah, I just I just I just wrote down that uh, you know, uh, life is or energy is created in the universe. Hydrogen is created as energy at 150 million degrees Celsius. So this is what we try now to repeat in ITER, ITER in uh, in south of France. Maybe you know about this, right? So I just wrote a little part of my next book uh, in in the chat. So you see, I see that you know um, we came from that heat, so we're going back to it. So we came from space and, and the more conclusion of, in my book as well, I conclude that we are that stardust that is put here somehow to sustain life as long as we can, because that's the evolutional order and the intent of life. What do you say? 
I agree, I agree, I agree. And uh, even I, I wrote a short article about comparing the, the immortality narratives that human have had through, through the centuries and, and with the cosmological models of the end of the universe. And they, I, I could match them very well. So oh, yeah, but what we are trying to do actually, when we model the end of the universe is to, well, what we are doing kind of subconsciously is, is, uh, to transfer our, our longing for immortality into, into the universe. Right. Okay. Well, hopefully we'll live a little longer here then. <laughs> Thank you. So it's, uh, it's about 10 to folks. Does anybody else want to come in with any questions, thoughts, reflections on what they've heard? Well, I think it was just something I tried to slip in before. It's a shame Peter Kavalak's not here. I'm just thinking, can we analogously consider the internet to be alive? Ah, yeah, sorry, I didn't reply to this. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> That's not my fault. I was trying to ask too many questions at once. <laughs> yes. Um, but I'm thinking also but, just generally the, the general crowd here. Anyone, any observations on that? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's a it, system, isn't it? The, the, the internet pretty much uh, resembles a virus and we can't decide whether the virus is alive or not. Uh, I think it's a good I, point. <laughs> uh, people all the time. <laughs> as long as it's communicated, it's alive, isn't it? Uh, well, for me, it's, uh, it's, I would say it's a uh, information distribution subsystem in a, in a living system theory. So, so if, if, if it's if only, right, it's not, um, sorry. If, well, if Peter is right in his, in his sort of hypothesis from earlier, I was hoping we could link back to that. Then, um, the, um, the internet is you know, through its human actors, if, if, if you insist, but is actually feeding on our energy to sustain itself. So the internet is, it, it's feeding on us and, and the, you know, its waste product, if you like, is the product of you know, the, the white vans full of cardboard boxes that get delivered to the various uh, houses around the universe. Um, so, so we're sustaining the life of the internet by, uh, and it's exploiting us. And, I think, uh, just we're not far from the, the AI type solutions that um, you know, attempt to flog us the stuff it think that, that they think we're interested in. So there is a sort of a, a, a lively dynamic. Sorry, Peter, go on. I, I apologize. Um, one of the reasons we are uh, so intelligent um, is uh, the fact that we move around. We've got incredible sensors and we can interact with our environment. And uh, it's not so much the processing power as a, an element of memory that gives us these sentient qualities. Now, the internet doesn't have to move because it's everywhere. And it has uh, quite incredible sensors. It's got cameras everywhere. It's got microphones everywhere. And best of all, it's got us helping it all the time and feeding it. So this, this could be, I think, considered um, either a parasitic or a hybrid life form. You know, and uh, it, in, in the way uh, a, a parasite will take over a body and let the body live because uh, the body is useful to it. Um, it's, it's, it's more of a, um, uh, what is it? What, what's, what's an orchid, Peter? What are they? They're, they're, um, oh, uh, yeah. you, you mean you mean the, the carnivorous uh, orchids? Yeah. Oh, yeah the, the, yeah, the orchids that live on plants that don't actually um, don't actually damage them in the process. Oh, uh, um, the, the acceleration of uh, AI over mm -hmm. the last decade has been entirely down to the packing factor of the chips on here. Um, and uh, this thing is uh, a couple of thousand times more powerful than uh, one of Seymour Cray's computers in the about 1987 era. And um, it, it's, um, I think the clock is ticking. It, the big question is, if uh, another life form does pop up, will we be smart enough to recognise that it is a life form? 
that's a good point on which to stop. Um, so, um, Clement, uh, Peter's not here. I will thank him separately. Thank you so much for that. It's been a really stimulating discussion. I hope we've been of some value to your, your thinking and, and stimulation. And we'd love to keep having you back and um, come back and challenge us again. And we'll argue with you again, um, no doubt, uh, because that's kind of what we do with these things. Uh, it's been a great session. Next month, we're going um, very different. We've got Keith Elford rejoining us. Uh, Keith just submitted his doctoral thesis. So, um, and that's on the nature of church and organizations. That'll be very, very different. Um, and Omar Karotti will be joining us to talk about tribal dynamics, a session he, he prepped for us at the Cybernetics Conversation last month. As ever, I'll try and get this onto the internet uh, as soon as I've got the time to process it. Um, and in the wise words of Douglas Adams at five to seven, I shall just say, so thank you, uh, good night, and thanks for all the fish. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Cheers, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.